You're listening to Earnestly Speaking, the only weekly podcast that covers friends, foes, and anything that goes. And now, for your badass host, Ernest Owens. And we're back for another episode of Earnestly Speaking with your host, Ernest Owens, myself. (laughs) Well, we are on the cusp of something great, right? The season two finale. Not premiere, finale. It has been an incredible season. And this is the final episode of the second season. Oh, goodness. You know, it's it almost feels like it was yesterday before we all, you know, started this at the beginning of what, 2021, an insurrection, ushered in a brand new podcast, and here we are over a year later. Still in shit, but <laughs> seeing good stuff happen, right? So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. This is the season two finale. Season three coming up. Um, well, season three, um, letting you all know in advance, I am taking a week off um, to, you know, kind of, you know, have a cute little vacation, put some space in between the episodes so people who you know, are trying to catch up, catch up before season three um, happens. And so my plan is um, I'm going to take off next week. Well, this week, and then the episode will be the following week. So uh, I'm going to New York this weekend, um, this upcoming weekend. And the season, season three premiere will be Monday, July 11th. So, yeah. Yeah, that would be... No, no, no. Actually, no. Take that back. It would actually be Monday, July 18th. So, we won't be seeing each other for two weeks. Yeah, season three premiere will be July 18th. Season three premiere, July 18th. Yeah, because I'm not doing it this upcoming week. And then um, this weekend, because I'll be in New York, relaxing, breathing, taking some time. And then you all get an episode from me July 18th. Monday, July 18th, season three premiere. Okay, get ready. Because you know between now and then, a lot of shit is going to go down. You already know. And so the season three premiere is going to be like epic. (laughs) It's going to be monumental. It's going to be like epic, like super epic. I can't even describe how epic it's going to be, but it's going to be colossal clearly because we're going to definitely have a lot to catch on. So it's going to be a super loaded episode. No fluff, no fillers. I mean, there's really no fluff and fillers on these podcast episodes anyway, but it's just going to be nothing but straight hits. So for all of those friends of yours and people who have been hearing about the podcast, tell them to catch up now. Tell them to listen to all the episodes, review season two, because as you know, there's a a pattern. There's a cycle. A lot of people say that they notice that there's a theme. And I love this episode. I- I'm super excited about this finale because there are some shocking conclusions. And then there's some things that will be answered in season three. <laughs> but there is a there is some conclusions uh, that's been following this season. And season three is going to be more exciting because clearly there's going to be, you know, uh, some continuation. But um, where do I start? I mean, first of all, um, happy 4th of Jamarcus, because we don't acknowledge the 4th of July on this podcast. Um, my best friend, Jamarcus Henderson, his birthday is on July 4th. Some of you call that other things, Independence Day and other stuff. We, we don't acknowledge that over here. So it's the 4th of Jamarcus here, um, or earnestly speaking. Um, and for those who are listening, you know, on July 4th, um, uh, or listening, whatever, it's the 4th of Jamarcus. That's that's what we consider on 4th of July. It's the 4th of Jamarcus. And so, in celebration, because to, on today, I suppose, on July 4th, right, he is 30. He turns officially 30. And he has a new single out called Boy of the South, which is a big record, right? A it's a single. It's It's got that house music feel for all of you who have been following, you know, Beyonce lately and standing and all that jazz. Um, Boy of the South is a hit. You know, I I, I cannot stop listening to it. Um, I'm completely excited. I, I need the I need the single now. Um, the single comes at the right time for people like myself who love a big bop. 
So it's boy from the South, not boy of the South, boy from the South. Um, BFTS, BFTS, boy from the South. And it is on all streaming platforms. So as you're listening to this podcast, you can also go to your favorite streamer, download or, you know, stream or whatever. Boy from the South, Jamarcus Henderson. He has also a bunch of other music, um, but this new single is epic. It incorporates that New Orleans bounce sound that you love from, um, you know, Beyonce's uh, Break My Soul. Um, This is that same type of feeling and energy, but also a little bit more um, vulgar and grown as I as I see through it um, or see to it. At least I I love it. Um, it, You know, you know his music already, because when you hear this instrumental that brings the podcast, that is um, that's him. That's my bestie. He produced the score for this podcast that you all have listened to many, many times. And so many people have brought up to me that we're getting into like the 100th like episode of this podcast. But to be very clear, it's more of the 75th episode because I'm looking at four episodes, no bonus episodes, which we've done a lot of bonus episodes in this podcast, but I'm looking at full like actual episodes. So technically this is the 75th episode of um earnestly speaking which is exciting um the 100th episode will be pot will be at the end of the year um but if you do count bonus episodes or whatnot we're actually a lot closer to 100 than before and bonus episodes do matter to some extent but i you know to keep up with the numbers game we are about to land on episode this is episode 75 um of the show so yes I've been consistent. I feel like a podcast pro. I feel like every time I do this show, I'm like, I don't know. I don't want to. Yeah, I'm getting better at it. But I also kind of understand it. And I get, you know, get to niche. When I first did this podcast uh, last year, you know, I was, you know, figuring out, uh, you know, understanding how to adjust from the radio formatting that I did like 10 years ago in college to now, but I, I think I have a groove now. I have a real groove. Um, and, you know, it, it, it just flows and I love it. And a lot of people, you know, talk shit about podcasters and people and things. Um, I do to myself because some people's podcasts aren't good, but there's some people that act like a person can't do a one man show. Well, you know, I think there's a reason why I have thousands of listeners and subscribers that say otherwise. I think smart people who say, um, incredible things and thoughtful things can do a podcast by themselves. I, I'm not throwing shade at people who have a, a partner or 4,000 people because sometimes you might need different people. But I think some people can do a podcast uniquely for themselves and, and do it the way that I do it. And, and it ain't for everybody, but it's for some. And I love doing it. You all love listening to it. I wouldn't be doing it if you do. So to some of the haters out there who out here throw shots about folks doing one-man show podcast. Listen, some of those guys that I know you're talking about, I'm not one of them, right? There are some people out here who just, you know, that are like, this is this is like their outlet for everything in between. They don't like have friends. They don't have a, a love life. They, they're mad about some ex that, you know, they, they're trying to get into the music industry. I mean, there's a lot of things that people could be doing for podcasts solo. I am not that person. I'm someone who actually produces news. And I just want to share it um, through my unfiltered view. So for those who like Earnestly Speaking, thank you for listening to Earnestly Speaking, um, of course. So July 4th, as you all know, you know, 4th of Jamarcus, my bestie, has is traveling right now. Um, he's in New Orleans. He's in Houston. He's doing like this wonderful, like nice long break to really just take in um, some time, you know, 30 is a big year. You know, I turned 30 last year. So he's out seeing his family, seeing people. He'll be back, I think, next week. Yeah, next week he'll be back. And I'm going to New York this week, this upcoming weekend, to see people. Um, and, you know, I've, I'm, you know how I feel about New York, okay? I'm, I'm not crazy about New York City, but I'm going to learn how to embrace New York City um, as is. So I'm really going to enjoy it uh, and embrace it and devour it and, uh, you know, see what it is. But, oh, yes, it's 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 a lot, Um, you know, uh, just a lot. 
Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes. And I think, what is it, cancer season now? So it's like all the cancers are really in full throttle. No, I've known some great cancers in my life. Leos, I suppose. Virgos, sure. And, of course, Libras. But, you know, it's great that one of my best friends is a cancer. My husband's an Aquarius. My other good friends are Capricorns. My mother's a Capricorn. Then I have some Sagittarius in my life. I have a lot of Aquariuses, too, outside of my husband. So it's like a lot of of different people. Um, but I, 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 I don't know. Like, I don't have that many Geminis in my mix. Not too many Geminis. Um, not too many Virgos. Uh, I don't, I mean, most of the, 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 the main core of my friend circle and people that are close to me are Sagittarius's, Capricorns, Aquariuses. My, one of my brothers is a Pisces. And I have a Cancer. But that's it. Like, everybody else is scattered. You know, and of course there's the Libra, who is myself. But mostly everybody else is, like, in different, you know, most of them are scattered throughout. But the concentration is that, is that you know, three-peat, that, that, that Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius circle. Like, everybody's birthdays. Like, if you ask me random names of people I know, like, their birthdays fall in there. Amanda, Sharon, Lauren, George, my mom, Mr. Johnson, Manny. Like, everybody's birthday is around that time. <laughs> they fall in that trap. My, my, my stepdad. So, everybody's birthday is in that, in that orbit. So, it's very interesting thinking about, like, just those three. And then everybody, like I said, everybody else is scattered, you know. Then there's holidays, right? Like, my birthday is, like, on Columbus Day, but it's Indigenous Peoples Day. I guess October 12th. Um, and then, of course, Jamarcus's birthday is July 4th. So, there's, like, all these other birthdays that kind of spread out, but they're, like, around special holidays. So, you know, random fun facts. But, yes, um, I didn't celebrate, you know, I don't really celebrate July 4th, um, especially with everything going on in the world now i just don't care for it i mean you all have juneteenth everything and and for better or for worse in some cases i'm just gonna keep it 100 but i'm just i, I haven't been feeling it this weekend like i just i'm like ugh, i haven't done anything i've just been resting i've been chilling i mean let's let's be clear i've had a, a lit week leading up to july 4th weekend but as far as with july 4th weekend i didn't go any cookouts i didn't do anything i just been at home chilling you know Mr. Johnson has had, has had a lot of fun at home. It's been a great time at home. You can do a lot of things at home. It's just you and your boo. And no one bothered. Everybody got stuff to do, so no one's like hitting you up and bugging you. It's a it's a very nice, peaceful thing. I caught up with some of my friends and you know, talked to them on the phone and caught up on on what they're doing. You know, it was just a real chill. I didn't write a damn thing this weekend. I didn't do any writing. I just chill. I just was like did nothing and enjoyed it enjoyed it because july is about to be chaos in a good way okay joy joyous joyful noise i would describe it as it's it's going to be you know a lot going on um in a good way i, I mean june june was crazy to be black and queer during pride month juneteenth or doom day whatever else you want to add on to it i mean i i yeah it was june was lit lit but July is going to be also um, its own bag of tricks. But you know, I'm enjoying it. But I said I'm going to take some some time to just chill uh, because a lot is about to go down. Um, a lot that I haven't shared. A lot that I've already just recently shared, I suppose. And I just, you know, when I have time to relax and chill, I'm going to relax and chill. There's some people that don't know what it's like to just sit down, sit their ass down somewhere. I am not against sitting my ass down somewhere. And relaxing. I think there's sometimes this itch that people have that they always have to do something. Oh no, I don't do anything I'm not invited to. I, now I love an invitation. I love uh, you and a plus one or whatever. I love that kind of stuff. But when there's those times where it's just like a very like nothing's really going on, I don't force it. I just sit and I be still and I just take some things in, process things. You know, because if you're always go, 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 then you're going to get to a point where I don't, you know, some people say the word burnout. Um, for me, it's never like a burnout, but it's just more of I, I need to sit down. <laughs> so I get a chance to sit down for a little bit. 
um, for a little bit because I don't need to be sitting down completely. Because then, 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 I, then, I, then I create, then I keep, create chaos. My friends know about that. Y'all don't. Mm-mm, mm-mm. But as far as <laughs> where I'm at now, I'm just like, I'm chilling. I'm chilling. You know, there's some people that feel like they just got to always be active. Like they always got to be doing something every single day. And I, and I always be like, why? Not every day. Or this, this notion of, I should, I feel like I should be doing something. Oh, no. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. I don't feel like I should be doing anything right now. Nothing is calling on me. There's no checks. There's no one saying, we need this. No, I'm sitting down. I'm out of my business. I'm chilling. You know? And even though I don't celebrate 4th of July, I know a lot of people are like all up in it, right? So they could do that. They could be cute, do that. I love that, though. Because then I have the ability not to have my phone buzzing with a bunch of stuff, right? And so I kind of like it. Because I know that come tomorrow, right? Come July 5th, come Tuesday, come Saturday, you know, Wednesday, whatever. It's gonna be the, the it's gonna be back on again. So I, I like when everyone's out doing stuff and I don't have to do anything. And I hate when people are asking me why were you there because I wasn't. <laughs> I hate that. Like we're like why weren't you here 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 why why I guess I guess the art of being a public person a public figure that there's this almost this expectation for some people. But it's like um, I actually and I don't want to be shady. Let me be clear. I don't like to be shady. Okay, I don't like to say, like, because I got other things to do, because I actually have friends in real life. No, I don't like to be shady. But, like, there are some people where they like to go to everything because that is their life. Like, they don't have other stuff going on in their personal orbit. So this outward life, right, that's centered around their career is their life. I have always been a person that believes in separation between professional life and personal life. Now, they can sometimes co-mingle, but I definitely think that your personal life is something very different from your professional life. If your professional life is your personal life, that's a problem. I, I just, I tell people there has to be a separation. You have to have space carved out of your labor in a way that allows you to connect with people. Most of the time I'm on the phone with my friends or family and people, I'm not really talking about my career. I mean, there some of them are like interesting. I'll ask about certain things and I'll talk about it. But I'm like, I just like to talk about stupid shit. I like to talk about personal circles and our friends and other shit going on. Like, it's nothing about like all the other things. I mean, that may be like 15% of the conversation, but everything else is about just shit that's like <laughs> not, not on this podcast type shit. Like, it's not like, oh, you know, you know, um, I'm working on this article and I've interviewed these people. I, I don't, you know, I mean, like, yeah, I'm working on this good story. It's coming out next month. You know, y'all see it, whatever. And I'll probably tell them things I won't tell you all yet. But then they'll be like, oh, okay, good. Cool, cool, cool. Let me know. And that's it. And then we're talking about, like, the stuff that is very stupid. Like, but, but, but comforting. <laughs> comforting, but stupid. Um, and <laughs> stuff that's just like, you'll be like, that's what Ernest spends his time talking about the phone for two hours. Yes, <laughs> because it soothes me. Because I I deal with enough real world, world stuff. Like most journalists I know um, that are doing the deep work, they're like goofballs in real life. Like they're like not living um, lives where it's like super serious. And the ones that are so pretentious, like no one's saying out with them. I'm gonna I'm not gonna name names, but like there's some people like oh my god you're you're like this in real life. I mean. Like, granted, I mean, like, I'm, listen, I am passionate about shit, right? I'm passionate about social issues and all that. But there are times where I believe to have some level of balance or normalcy in life, there's, there, you have to completely find that space because you'll go, you'll, it will drive you to the edge. It will push you to the edge. I know a lot of folks and colleagues in this industry that I'm in that have had mental health issues and just have had a lot of other anxieties and frustrations because they couldn't find that separation. So that was something I learned very early in my career to have a life, like Ernest, get a fucking life. And and that was what it was told, like get a fucking life out of this because this is, listen, this is, this is, this is part, but this shouldn't be all. And that was the best goddamn advice I got um, next to getting a lawyer and, and having your own finances and shit. That was the first thing, right? But the second thing definitely was, um, 
having an actual life outside of this, which has been helpful because there are times when I want to just be politically incorrect and just be frank and be blunt and really not and be in a safe space where people get me and understand how I feel about things. Because sometimes I'm not going to say anything, everything as, I don't know, as considerate as, you know, I need to in a public space. But like when I'm with my friends, I'm sometimes just want to say, this is some fucking bullshit. Like, I just want to just be real frank, super frank. And, you know, I think if you're always trying to put on, you're always thinking and considering about everyone around you, eyes on you all the time. You're, you're missing out from opportunities to be human. But at that being said, find your tribe, build re- real re- relationships that matter, and you know, carry on. So that's what I've been doing this, this, this weekend. Just reflecting, breathing, resting, taking naps, sleeping, chilling, drinking, fucking, doing, you know, human things and enjoying the elements of that <laughs> because oh goodness there's some people out here i'm just like listen baby that bag is still going to be there you can go chase it but before then drink some water take a nap wash your face wash your ass and under your arms take care of yourself breathe get a life have you know an orgasm do something but but you just can't you know just be healthy be happy I try. I try to encourage people that. People around me too. They, it, you know, I, I, the big thing I always remind myself, because I'm on this sermon clearly right now, um, I always remind people around me, it's just like, whatever you're worried about right now, just think of, I don't know, the holidays when you're eating a Thanksgiving turkey or Christmas or New Year's or whatever, right? Just think to, or Hanukkah, right? Just think to yourself, will you be thinking about that thing? Then, and if the answer is no, then why are you stressing out now? Because it's not that serious, right? There are things in the world, right? You might have health conditions, and there's things to be concerned about. Preserve your energy and your mental space for the emergencies like that, rather than just harping on some shit that's just not going to be relevant in a week or two. I, I really tell you that one of my pet peeves is I don't like to be around, I don't really like to be around people that are super like anxious about small shit that are always in panic mode that's always freaking out i don't like it it's like my biggest pet peeve i've noticed that i've had to mm, mitigate my environment sometimes when i go to in certain spaces and places like recognizing other triggers like okay these people here are super intense or these people are going to be so scatterbrained. And I don't like that. If I could avoid to be around people like that, I do. I'm not saying that people can't be like that all the time, but I just hate it. I hate it. Um, I hate perfectionism. I'm. People will say that I'm a perfectionist, but I'm not. Surprisingly, I'm not. I think what's been beautiful about my career has been that it's been about embracing imperfectionism. It's been about the perfection for me has been in the authentic, the, you know, the, just the truth, the authenticity of it all. I think that's been a perfection for me. Is like perfection to me is is this real? Does this represent me? Is this does does this does this communicate my who I am? And I don't look at all the other things that and all that shit. I I've been off of that for a long time because what I've realized about trying to be a perfectionist and all that shit is that. First of all, you're trying to be a perfectionist for motherfuckers who are un- per- imperfect. You're trying to be something that the for people that aren't either. Like, who are these other people? And so I think perfectionism is oftentimes rooted in insecurity, second-guessing, ga- uh, what's it, imposter syndrome. It's, it's really a lot of things. And I'm not saying that that's not human traits, because when I was very young, I dealt with that. And and I realized as I got older that a lot of that was rooted in me seeing the the views, valuing the views of other people. Like my perfectionism came into my presentation, how I talked, my mannerisms, all of these things. But it was also centered around not coming across as gay when I was not out when I was younger. And when I began to embrace who I was and, and embracing my queerness and my blackness simultaneously, 
then I began to let go of, of perfectionism and really embrace. And that was my route to embracing myself in totality. Because for me, a lot when, once I got into a place of accepting who I was when I was very young, and, and so I've been doing this work for a minute on myself. But when I got to that place of really accepting who I am and, and, and all of those things and really understanding my identity and, and really coming to that place, then everything else became to be a metaphor for that, where it was like, okay, so this, 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 this aspect of giving a fuck about, if I don't give a fuck about what people think about who I am as a black queer person, I shouldn't give a fuck about how people judge my career goals. Like everything became an extension of that embrace. So when I was able to fully embrace and love myself as my identity, then I began to love who I was as a, as a professional, as a journalist, as a husband, as a best friend. Like I began to look at all those other aspects of myself and give myself that same loving care. And so my advice to people out there who are like struggling with perfectionism is like, if there's an aspect of yourself that you're loving and you're learning to love, give that same level of care and love to other aspects of your identity yourself and apply it that way. And then you'll realize that these things are, are, are connected. So if I love myself as a black person, as a black man, if I really love and, and embrace my culture, my heritage, who I am, right, as a black man, then that level of, of, of not giving a fuck about what other groups and communities think about me, whatever that je ne sais quoi is, for that, I'm going to apply that to career profession, and which is what I did, where I was in the industry in journalism and people were like, oh, well, this is the way to be successful this way. And I started saying, well, no, I'm not going to let y'all tell me what this is. I know who I am. I'm confident. I love what I do. I love what I represent, right? I took that same energy in those arenas and that's when the success and, the, and things began to click. That's when things began to start to flourish because I had to let go of all of it across the board. Like I let go of white supremacy. I let go of elitism. I let go of, of classism. I let go of all these other things that were judging me. You got to look at all of those different departments in your life the same way. Like unleashing and letting go of all of those different elements. So if, you're, if you've gotten to a place where you're embracing your gender or your sexual orientation or your racial identity, all these other things... Whatever those other insecurities that lie in other aspects of your life, apply that same no fucks given because it's the same beast. It's the same system. It's the same issue. It's just repackaged in a different type of setting. Once I understood that, things began to click. Things began to make sense. And then I just start pushing. And, and that's how we got here. So I really encourage people to just take that in. It just came upon me to say that because I was just hearing, you know, people talk about, you know, different people's careers and trajectories and all of these things. And it's just like most of the people who are critics and judges of those other aspects of folks' careers and their journeys, those people are trying to figure out their journeys too. You know, no shade to Wendy Williams, but Wendy Williams spent over a decade, many, many years judging other people's trajectories and careers. And long behold, she had a lot of unresolved issues in her own life that she needs to be addressing within herself. And if she would have applied that same energy to her personal life, she probably would be in a different space. Or maybe she would have kind of understood the empathy she should give to other people in that journey. Who knows? I mean, granted, we can all be having opinions about folks, but at some extent, you better be making, you better be making sure that sure giving that level of attention to your personal life. And that's something, that's what I mean by striking that balance about getting a life, right? That while I do a lot of work where I do weigh in and I do have opinions about what's going on in the world around me, I am also taking time to look in my own circles, my family life, my friends, and checking in with people. You got to apply that same level of pressure and energy both ways. Because if you don't, that's how, that's how the, the problems persist, to be honest. So, and... Other news. So I'm listening to Boy from the South. Please listen to that. That is a Jamarcus Henderson production. Uh, you can find his music all over. 
And when you're on the way of doing that, check out this podcast appearance. I've made another podcast appearance. Last week, I was on Woke AF with Danielle Moody. Well, this week, I'm on a podcast called uh, Be a Better Ally podcast. And I'm on there uh, talking to some really great thought provokers and and people who um, are doing some great stuff. Um, I was very impressed to be on this show. Um, So be... A Better Ally podcast. The episode is episode 79. It's called Reset, Reclaim, Remind. That is the name of the episode. I'm the special guest of that episode. Uh, The Be A Better Ally podcast is a part of the Be A Better Ally newsletter mission. And it is really progressive. It's really pushing... um, how people could be um, L- um, LGBTQI plus allies. And I was a special guest um, last week's episode. You can watch it. Uh, Trisha Friedman is the host of that podcast. She, um, you know, they brought me on uh, to talk about the issues. It was great. It was great. Trisha Friedman, incredible, um, you know, activist. And this podcast is great. It's on a website called ally.org. A-L-L-Y-E-D dot org. And it's about LGBTQ um, issues and whatnot. So I highly recommend it. I was on there talking about my book, The Case for Council Culture, um, which people are getting excited about. Listen, I'm surprised by how many people are like hitting me up. Like it's 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 a movement. Like we're 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 getting we're getting up there. I mean what are we up to? What we're like seven months away now? I mean, we're now, yeah, we're about seven, eight months, eight months away. Eight months away. Yeah, eight months away from the book. So the book's coming out. I mean, next thing you know, we'll be down to six month countdown soon. So it's a it's a lot of movement. This this book is is definitely doing what it's doing. And the pre-orders have been great. More people have been pre-ordering this week. It's increased probably a lot because I've been just out and about and my traffic's been, you know, been generating and um it's been an it's been a journey. So um yeah, so please make sure you check out Be a Better Ally, that podcast, because it's super dope. Um the other thing I wanted to talk about, because this is the best news ever, I have found a place. Yes, me me and Mr. Johnson have found our dream abode um in Philadelphia. After a month, as you all know, of bullshit experiences with um, realtors and all this jazz, we have found a lovely place um, that we're super excited about. Um, brand new, never before, you know, brand new built. And for those people, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to dispel a rumor. People think I live at the Poplar Apartments. I'm gonna get to why people think that in a minute. But to set the record straight, no, I do not live in the Poplar Apartments. Which they're nice, but they're, they're the popular apartments are in Northern Liberties. It's really pretty. They have a beautiful pool decked out. I'm gonna, I don't want to interrupt what I'm talking about to talk about it, but I do not live there. Um, the tabloids, the, the the tabloids and the blogs have been lying. I do not live there. That's not where I'm living. Um, I'm living somewhere else, and I'm not disclosing where I live because privacy and boundaries fucking matter. Um, but I am living in Philly. I I found the place of my dreams. Me and Mr. Johnson both were were agreed on this. We both liked the place together. Because sometimes, you know, when you're traveling with a partner, a spouse, a lover, whatever, and you're, you know, you're having to make these decisions. Sometimes you're like, one thing you like, the other person don't like it, or there's something they want. But this was something we were like, yes, yes. And by the way, the process from doing a tour to filling out application to getting approved was <laughs> bing, bing, bang. Okay. I'd have to give my taxes. There wasn't any extra request, no co-signers, no anything. Like, that was straight bullshit. And we're, and we're still a very much so fuck OCF. Um, because, like, what the fuck, right? Not a big fan of OCF, um, real estate and properties. You know, I had shared a couple episodes back what happened to myself and my husband when we was, you know, looking at units and, and properties and shit. And it was just not a good experience. But I love the fact that I hit goals because our goal was that at the end of June, we wanted to officially 
you know, declare to, to officially know where we were living because, you know, you know, I, 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 my previous move in situations were always chaotic. It was always like we found a place like, well, this will be our, this will be our second place we've lived together. Our current, the current place I live now, we've, this is like, uh, this is the first like lease we signed together as a couple. And it was like, we've been living here for five years, but now, you know, like in the past, cause before, so when I graduated from Penn 2014, I moved into a small studio. Then I moved into the, my current place. So each of those experiences were like abrupt moving situations. Like it was like, oh, I found a place, signed a lease. And then I only had like a couple of days to get movers. And then you couldn't get the best movers because they were already booked. So it was a lot of, you know, just trying to just, you know, pack up and everything. Now that we are like, we're moving into our new place um, at the start of September. I love this because now we have a situation where I have time, right? We have time to get the, the, the movers, to get the movers we wanted because Mambo movers are the best fucking movers. Mambo movers in Philadelphia, I've always wanted to use them. I used them, I got to use them uh, last time, which was five years ago. They were on the best affiliate list for Philadelphia Magazine a couple of years ago. They are like the best in what they do. They have the best professionals. They have the best rates. They just are pros, okay? They are pros. Like, I, I don't want anyone else touching my shit but Mambo members. So, because they're, like, very popular, like, they get booked. Like, you can't just call them the week before. Like, they're booked. They're always booked. So, the fact that I was able to call them, like, on July 1st, and was like, look, I got to play September 1st, they locked me in. Okay? And I had one of the few slots that they still had left. Because you got to remember, moving, normally, a lot of these people do the move-ins, like, the first of the month. So you're competing. And I know that fall is hectic because a lot of people, like that September 1st is when it meet people, people go you know, back to school, do jobs, new locations. So it's a lot of that extra hassle that comes with that first move in situation. Fortunately, I was able to lock this in and it was a perfect situation. So I'm so grateful. I'm so excited. We're both happy. The amenities at this place are phenomenal. Like there's going to be a full gym, 24-hour service, a rooftop, jacuzzis, conference working space rooms, lounges, other units, a garage. Like, oh my God. Like, this is like everything we needed. And I just, like, I'm going to go back to the gym because I hate going to the gym. That, that's another story for another day. I hate going to gyms, like, period, because I don't like working out in front of people. I don't like the whole thing of like getting sticky and like going, like getting sticky and going to like, uh, like having to get in the car or use the gym there. Or the, I, 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 I am very like, it's a, it's a, it's an intimacy thing for me. And so the fact that I'm going to be able to go to this place, live here, like, and like, work out and then go straight to my crib, take my shower, take the elevator up. And down. Like the fact that I can have that leisure. Oh my God, that's going to be a game changer. So I'm going to enjoy this summer, but like, I can't wait till September. I can't wait to be up in my new place. I can't wait to start doing, doing the work, but I'm going to enjoy my summer. Let me just say that. I'm going to enjoy my fucking summer. Some of you all listen. Okay. But I'm going to enjoy my summer. But I am looking forward to that. That is something exciting because it's, it's yeah, that's going to be motivation for sure. Also, I can host more events. Like, I don't really have people at my current place um, because when I got it, it was, like, the perfect size. Now I just have a bunch of boxes and shit. But, like, now we can host things. We can host parties and mixers and vibes. Like, there's going to be things. I just, uh, I, I can't disclose, but... It's it's going to be popping. It's going to be lit. It's going to be a movie. And um, I love the fact that I'll get to be near my friends and my, my, my best friend, Amanda. She's coming to town this month, you know, Miss, Miss Dr. Parks. Everybody else is in the area. Like, I'm going to be able to still, like, you know, have my flow. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that as much as well, too. So there's a lot. There's a lot of good. Good, just a lot of good vibes with that. Like I, that was something, and you all knew. You could tell in my voice 
a couple of episodes that that was just something that was just like, can this get the fuck cracking? Like, can we hurry the fuck up with this? So I'm, I'm looking, I'm happy that that chapter is like resolved. Like they got all my deposits. They got all of our deposits. They got all of our, of our shit, insurance, all the shit we needed. We did everything. Okay. We, we got everything set. Stuff has been signed. Stuff has been made. Like everything is booked. So I'm I'm completely happy and just shout out to some people who was looking out and 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 you know who you all are. Um thanks for just yeah, I'm just happy about everything. I'm just ha huh, the sigh of relief because now I can do the fun stuff. So we're like looking into interior designing because we're not really taking any much old shit to this new place. Um we're pretty much, I mean, you know, like I said, I haven't really opened any of my wedding stuff, Mr. Johnson, you know, got away with opening the blender, but the juicer did not get open. Everything else did not get open. So there's a lot of stuff that we've had for now. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some stuff that we've had for two years that has not been opened. I mean, there's still nice shit. I mean, it's like, look, we got La Crescent and all the other things. We haven't opened anything because we, you know, I'm like, I don't want to pack all that up and there's no need. So I can't wait to go to the new crib because now we can open up all this stuff. We don't like a home warming party is not going to really be a home warming party because everybody who would come to it have basically already given us this stuff as wedding presents. So there's like no need for homecoming. Just bring bottles of champagne and money. And no, I'm not inviting strangers. So don't even ask, but like, it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be a cute little situation. It's gonna be real fun. But like, I love the fact that I can, you know, see all of this stuff now because it's just been in the boxes. There have been the boxes, but we, we're getting an interior designer to do stuff like put, you know, artwork and deco and new furniture and all this stuff. There is a great website. It's called Havenly. Um, that is not he- not Heavenly, Havenly. So H-A-V-E-N-L-Y.com. Um, you can book a virtual um interior designer at different rates. You can do it in person. Um, I think it's like $500 and the person will come to your place and do the measurements and, and, and kind of, you can work directly with someone or you can do, I think 175, you could just do, a, they could do a whole design plan for you. Uh, but you have to be more forthcoming with your dimensions, your, your pictures. You have to provide all that to them. There's inspiration. You can send them pictures and graphics of things that you're going for, things of inspiration. So we've been compiling all of that stuff and working with some we have a really great um designer her name is andrea um and she's been doing some really great stuff i like the way that she designs so we're working with andrea to like really get this place together so we're focused on our bedroom and then the living room space and then you know every i mean bathroom i mean it's it's like a marble situation so it's not much i mean we can add a couple of things but i don't really care the bathroom in its natural glassy marble state is pretty enough to me my mother did get us some Versace like towels because I've been obsessed with like, you know, the robe, the slippers, all that. So she actually got us some Versace towels and I think I'm going to put those in the bathroom so it can be a little bit regal. But the living room, the bedroom, all of that, we're going to um get the designer to help with that. So I'm looking forward to see what she's going to do. It's my first time doing it, but my homie George re- recommended it. Um and I saw what his place looked like. He just moved into a new crib with his husband, and I was impressed. So Havenly, uh, Havenly.com. Go there. If you're, I mean, even if you if, if you're not moving, right? You just want to do something new to an office space, something. Try them. I mean, try them first. Check them out. They're they, they're reasonable, and they have a good thing going. And I think they have like a Fourth of July discount or whatever. So if you're listening to this podcast or any of you, maybe would jump, jump on that 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 discount code, okay? So highly recommend them. Um, super excited about what they're going to bring to the table. And let me just say this, because I know some people probably listen to this and think about this. So I, I think about you all when I'm describing this stuff. What they do is that they you give them the measurements, you give them the walls, you give them the inspiration and look. They come up with a mock-up plan with items. Every single item that they put in the mock-up are things that you can purchase. And they will direct you to the stores and the websites to purchase that stuff. Now, George told me, or Gio, as we call him affectionately. Gio told me that they give you a list of things. Now, you know how this is. There's always a hustle. 
they might have some special commission or relationship. I, I wouldn't doubt with some of these places, like Crate and Barrel, all these places. What he said is that there are going to be some things they're going to show you that you're going to be like, I love that sofa and I don't want anything else. And you're going to buy the sofa or you're going to buy the love chair or whatever or the rug. But if there's some things on there that you're like, OK, this is like a little plain. Let me price compare. He price compared and looked on Target and found a similar mirror, found a similar situation and paid way less. So don't feel obligated to buy everything or think you did. Just price compare. Sometimes they, th those people designing the look for you and giving you an inspiration to start, and then you work around the pieces that you want. So you might buy some of their pieces, but then you might buy other pieces to replace what they offered because you found something better that you might like. But it gives you a really great place and space to start because a lot of times that's hard. And again, I've never been into into the whole interior design world before. You know, even though I've been at Philadelphia Magazine, I've seen designers now Livingston, um, now Niall Johnson, now Livingston Richardson Johnson, all these great designers who do this great work. Right? You know, they've been doing that stuff, and I see people get into that. But for me, it's never been a thing. Like we never thought of it. We just like we just want somewhere that's decent. But now that we're in this new place, it's like we get to really shape and design the place we want to live and that's important like a hundred percent like you know i want to have this right the first time like i want to move into a really this is like our first like real like marriage you know abode this is like our first ever like real marriage like living so you know we want to really do it up do it right um and it's gonna be fun so i'm super excited about that so I went viral this week because I did a thread about <laughs> this very topic. Um, you know, one of the things about, I guess, public figure life is that while you share these good experiences, there's always going to be a group of people that are going to um, ask too many questions or be a little too invasive. And sometimes, of course, be problematic um, in that process. And that can be a bummer, right? But one of the things that annoyed me this week was that there were questions that were being asked like, oh, well, first off, there were questions like, oh, what area? None of your business. How much did you pay for? None of your business. How did you get that? Now, that's where I get fucking pissed off. I get upset when, like, I just think when you ask the person about an achievement and, you, and they, in the word, the term, the question is, how did you get that in regards to an achievement? What, what am I supposed to say outside of, I paid for it, um, I earned it? Like, what, what, what are we saying here? And there's a lot of that kind of rhetoric that happens to women, to to black and brown people, this, like, I never hear people ask a white person when they announce a job or a new car or whatever. How did you get that, Chad? No one ever asked Chad that question. But black people are always being asked how you get that. Like, as if, I don't know, we, you know, like, it's just, it's the wording. And as a journalist, I'm all about words and language. And people have gotten out of pocket. Then there's those intrusive questions of, where I, I, you know, as somebody who's a professional nosy person, I can smell motherfuckers being nosy from a mile away. Um, hey, listen, I keep it 100. As a journalist, I'm going to ask questions. I'm going I'm to do my job, right? But I get paid to do, be the journalist. But I hate when people try to... Uh, what's that? Journalism me? Like, 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 I don't know the T, how, how this works. Was a question like, oh, you know, um, looking at like the, the posing of concern to try to be nosing information. So where, wh wh who did you work with to get that deal or, or whatever? Because, you know, it's a lot of, you know, realtors and people out here that are doing shape. Like, bro, like, so you just think I don't have a lawyer, a team. You don't think I have folks that do this. Like, I, I just wonder how people shape it. But a lot of times, like, rather than really ponder on if it's bullshit, I just often get to the point where I realize Actually, some people are just being nosy and you just have to tell them that's none of their business. And whether their feelings are hurt or not, I think sometimes you just have to say, 
I'm not doing that. So I was out at an event this week and this woman who I don't really know that much, um, I, I've seen her at events. She goes up and she does this thing of like, oh, congrats on your new place. And I'm like, cool. Thanks. Thanks. I didn't say cool. Let me be clear. I said thanks. But my mom was like, okay, this is cool. But I said, oh, thank you. Very nice. Very simple. Goes in the, so what area are the new digs? And I'm like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't really mind sharing. And they were like, oh, okay. Well, it's not like I'm a stalker or anything. And my mom like, that's not what I said, but okay. So then goes into, well, I, I'm just saying, I was just saying, because it's so hard to get, to get a, to get anything in this market. You must, uh, you must, uh, you know, you know, you know, have to give an arm and a leg. And it's like, why are you doing this? This is so uncomfortable. And why are you projecting? This is not okay. Like, this is too much. And I don't think people really realize how they come across. Now, let me do a quick earnest etiquette moment for people. When you, when people share good news and you don't know them like that, a.k.a. italics, like that, you know what like that means. Like that means, did you come, have you been in this person's house before? Do you kick it with this person? Do you chill with this person? Has this person gone to any of your life-changing events? Are you in a relationship with this person where you can share and disclose? Do you have that kind of close relationship? If you don't have that, that's not like that. Let's be clear. Okay, people know what like that. Like that means, do you text me on a regular basis? Do we talk to each other on the phone? Do we go to each other's houses? Do we kick it? That's like that. That's what it means. If you don't know someone like that, then you don't... you. you, you you just better keep it simple. So this is for my not like that people. Well, you don't know a person like that, okay? Because there's a lot of people that do the whole, you're like my brother in my head. I, I cringe sometimes when I hear that. Not because, let me be clear. Uh, there are some people in community that hearing that, it's okay. Just don't be overbearing. But there's some people where I don't know you from, from, a, from another park. And you just coming too strong and it's real creepy, especially when we don't know each other. Like, it's okay. Like, you can be an admirer. We can be admirers, but it's, it's just, it's like, it can be a lot sometimes when people just do so much. But there was this guy who was like, I see you as my little brother, as my little brother in my head. You, I see you as my little brother in my head and I just want to look out for you, blah, blah, blah. But you're asking me all these questions on a public forum. Uh, you could have gotten the DMs. Would have been a little intrusive still, but it could have been differently. But to my point about etiquette, when people share, you know, good news, they got a job, they got accepted to somewhere, whatever. What you say is, if you want to show actual etiquette, if you, it's congratulations. I'm so happy for you. That's awesome. Kudos to you. Great job. That's wonderful. Whatever. That's what you say. That's how I look at it, personally. Now, if you know the person, maybe you should give them a phone call, text them, tell them, look, drinks on me when you get to town, girl. You know, something like that, that's different. A gift or something, that's different. What you don't do is you don't bombard them with personal questions about said role and start interrogating them like a damn dog or a damn person that's in a hot chair. So where do you live? What part of town? How much did you pay? Who's a realtor? When you're moving in? Like, what the fuck? What the goddamn? That that's that's not normal. That's not okay. You don't do that to people. Like, that's creepy. That's weird. Do you have any etiquette? Do you have any manners? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? I don't care what planet I'm on. Whenever people share me good news, tell me good news that I am that I even my closest friends. I normally am like, hey, that's awesome. Well, that's really great. And naturally, a good friend that you know like that will tell you everything else without you having to ask or will be in conversation where they open it up for those kind of questions. But some of you don't know, just bombarding you in that kind of way, it's like, that's problematic. And there's some people that need to, and it's funny because I said on my social, like people need to freshen up on their manners after this pandemic. And people thought about hygiene. Well, yes, freshen up on your hygiene too. Because some of y'all out here forgot to like, I mean, I know that masks let some of y'all slip with like chewing gum and mouthwash and all that stuff. But like now that you're not wearing masks as much, I mean, get that breath together, please. But I wasn't talking about hygiene. I was talking about actual manners and etiquette. Like these are the things you don't supposed to just do. 
And I think because some people have not been around other people or they maybe have they forgotten their manners or maybe they never had them because this is Philadelphia, no shade. But whatever it is, get a grip, people. Like be just like seriously. If you've never heard this before, use this podcast and this segment as an opportunity to freshen up on your etiquette because some of y'all have been getting out of hand. So this went viral. People was just all over sharing it and talking about it. But I said what the fuck I said. And if it was feisty and spicy, it is what it is. But I think it's important sometimes as a public figure to sometimes, you know, if I got to clap back and remind people a little bit to back off or to chill out, it's my right. Last month, I saw Tom Hanks. He was with his wife. And Tom Hanks, his wife, Rita, he was out with her. And there was a situation where... They were walking and they were doing a good job, but somebody ran up on them to the point that literally Rita, his wife, fell down and he like lost it. He had to say he cursed. And I've never heard Tom Hanks curse in real life. Like I was like, ooh, like, because you know, but at the same time, I was like, I know that's right. Like, yes, back the fuck up. Like sometimes like we're all regular people. Yes, some of us, all of us have extraordinary powers and special talents and things. But at some point, you have to, you know, check yourself. It's not to say that you can't say anything to people, but just be mindful. It doesn't have to be a, a all or nothing. It's just be considerate, be mindful. I, I, I think of all the people I talk to and people I reach out to, I just am thoughtful. I'm just considerate. I just give people their roses if people are fucking up, I'm dragging them. But, like, I'm just, like, if people are just having a good time, give a love, show some love, take congrats, keep it moving. That's it. Keep it moving. You see a person in person doing good? Don't do the, I heard you doing some things. No, stop playing with people. Hey, I saw your face on your post on Facebook. Congratulations. What happens to just being a nice person? The most simplest, politest ways are always the most touching to me. When people are doing the fucking most and they don't know you or when people are like projecting or when people are doing a bombarding, those are always like turnoffs for anybody. I mean, I'm talking about myself right now, but anybody, I think anybody, when people share great news, don't overwhelm them. Don't bombard them. Like be fucking, you know, decent. Goodness. Is it hard out here to get decency in this country? Goodness. So, yes, as you can tell, this is going to be an episode because clearly I got to give y'all something to hold on to a dissect before we take this break. But, yeah, that was interesting. So let me get to this pool. So we got invited to the most lit pool party of the year thus fucking far. OK, the Lit Brothers was in full effect. We were at the Grand Poplar Apartments. Um, they had a pool party. A so Somar is this rooftop pool party. We was out there, Northern Liberties. It was lit. Everybody, the mother was there. Y'all saw the vibes. Y'all saw the pictures. And y'all were liking them. Y'all, listen, Gio, Josh Eats Philly, myself, and Jamarcus. It was VIP. We brought our good Judy Sharon. George brought his sister. It was lit, okay? We had a good time. We had a really good time. Beautiful people. Beautiful photos. Lots of melanin was in the crowd. The drinks were long but strong. And it was a good time. Okay? We had a good time. That was a summer. That's what That was a summer kickoff for me. That was a summer party. Like, when I think of a summer party, that's what I think of. I'm like, that's how you throw a pool party. Now, I'm throwing a pool party um, in August with my organization. And... Let me just say this. That is going to be the pool party of the summer. But these other pool parties have been great. So let me get to the messiness of some of y'all people with some of y'all bad manners. There was a rumor that was spread um, out. Uh, oh, and Gio's sister's name is Tori for those. And yes, she is single because some of y'all was asking, who was the beautiful sister with the fro? That was Tori. That's Gio's sister. She is single and she's cute and she's adorable. We love her. I just wanted to say that because y'all was thirsting and, you know. I guess she's available. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? I mean, I, I mean, she's definitely single and young and want to mingle and grown and lovely. So just wanted to shout her out. <laughs> um, so a rumor was spread in the tabloids, on the blogs, that I was moving to the popular apartments. 
<laughs> not true. I'm not living there. That is not my new place at all. Like, cut it out. There has been people, like, there. this has been a thing. It is not true. I do not, I'm not living in a popular apartments. Stop the rumors. Uh, cruise control. Damage control. Uh, uh, uh. No, I just went there for a pool party to have fun with my friends. Damn y'all so nosy. Y'all will have no clue where it's at. No guessing games. And don't message me. I'm not telling you. Even if the answer is correct, I'm not telling you where it is. I'm not even going tell you where it's located. Yeah, I'm not even going to tell you that. Even some of y'all may be smart and like know where it's probably located because I was very clear on other episodes. But no, I'm not telling you where it's at. And I'm not telling you anything. And like, mind your fucking business. I'll tell you what I want to tell you. How about that? But it has been wild because... The tabloids have been just the people on the line. Like, folks were like, oh, you know, oh, I see you moving on up to the pop. I'm like, I'm not moving on up anywhere. That isn't, where did you hear that from? Well, you know, a little birdie told me. I said, well, first of all, that's a lie. And whoever that birdie is, is a fucking pigeon because that's not true. No, I'm not living in the pop law apartments. I, I, no. I, I have no shade. I just, no, that's just not, no, my, I like where I live more, actually. No shade, but Poplar is nice. But where I'm going is is nicer. But they're nice too, okay? You know, but yes. Mm. And this party was cute. Let me say this about this pool party, because one of my friends listening, a couple of my friends was at pool party, they're gonna listen to this episode, they're gonna say, Ooh, no, you did it. I'm like, yes, I did. All I'm gonna say is, is that some of these influencers at these parties, and y'all know I was talking about influencers in my last couple episodes, but some of these influencers need to get a grip. Because as much as I am influential and I, I, I have that, baby, you talking to somebody who got over 10 years of, in the game, doing journalism and media work, okay? Because when the TikTok goes down like the way that Vine did, some of us are still going to be relevant. And so there was somebody that was at the event doing the most. Talking about how that this was their place and introducing me to it like they was putting me on somewhere. And I was like, sir, you need to chill, okay? Because he was doing too much. And it's interesting to me because I be hearing like these people be out here faking lifestyles, cutting up, doing the most. And I'm like, but you're over here. You're an influencer for them to stay at your place for free. You don't even pay your rent there. That's cute. But like you a grown ass man influencing to get your rent paid for. No shade in the hustle, but like don't, don't, don't do me. People be out here doing the most on, on these damn events. And I'm just like, listen, listen, you know, it's cute. Some people that turn their mistress into their girlfriend to be able to flex like they a single bachelor in these streets. They got whole families that they neglected so they can be out here living their life. I'm just saying, don't, you know, some people be out here doing too much. I'm just saying, keep it cute. Don't do too much. Don't get too fly with the wrong one. Because it's a lot of things out here, you know, influence the world, all that little stuff. Listen, be humble. <laughs> be humble. Just, 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 just don't, don't, you know, me, I'm silent money. And a lot of people are learning that. I'm silent money. There's loud money and there's silent money. I was taught very, very young to be silent money. <laughs> My old school cats know what I'm talking about. Silent money. A lot of loud, it's, a, it's a lot of loud money out here in these streets. Be silent money. Be silent money. And it's cute when you're young and you black and you silent money because people always think you broke. And that's fine. I, I don't care. I, I don't care. You can think whatever you want, but don't be disrespectful. There's a lot of people out here who loud as hell with their coins and they talking to people that are sitting on other things and while I'm not the type to pull out all the receipts and things because I'm not that kind of girl, somebody going to do it to you and you're going to get your feelings hurt. And so I tell people, be respectful. I've had some moments right recently where people have done that to me. And there's some times where there's the childish side of myself that comes out and say, you know, what, I'm going to. But I'm like, you know what? No, 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 no. I have nothing to prove to anyone. But it's been funny lately because, you know, stuff has been coming out in the press. Um, you know, Philly Mag, Philly Wedding Magazine did my wedding. There was some disrespectful people that was like, oh, wow, your wedding was gorgeous. How could you afford that? You know, there, there are just those moments where you just have to be like, you know what? Somebody doesn't pay attention and that's okay. But I'm going to need you to get yourself together. So, you know, my response to that person was afford. Like, it was a, like a questioning way. Afford. 
Ouch, that's interesting. Oh, I didn't mean it like that. I'm just saying like, oh my goodness, like I couldn't afford anything like that. I said, oh, you couldn't afford anything like that. Okay, well speak for yourself. I shut it down just like that. Because people try it. People people like that. My thing is don't project your insecurities in ways that get you out here being disrespectful of people. If, you, if it's something that you feel like you can't afford, then don't ask someone how. Again, it goes back to that. How did you get this? It's really, this type of language is coddled in racism, it's coddled in ageism, it's coddled in sexism for women. I see this happen to a lot of women too. Like you talk, like my mother is a perfect example. My mother, you know, had her first divorce, whatever, and she was out here raising me and my brothers and she was doing certain things. There were men that was like, oh, so your man got you that? And she like, man, and I, and I didn't understand that back then, like what that, what that was meaning. But there was presumptions that a woman couldn't be able to do those things by herself. And so I grew up understanding how to be a feminist and how to support black women and be a black feminist in many ways through seeing my mother's experiences and understanding and seeing women be able to do incredible things without the presence of a man or with the support of a man. Either way, right? Live your best life, right? But I learned that those experiences through her. And when I see these things, it takes me back to those times where I saw people ask my mother questions that they would have never asked the man. And I, I've seen them. Even when I was, when, when my mother was my stepfather, like when we go out and there are times my stepfather will drive or do something or whatever, and they would never ask those questions to him. But then my mother would do the same thing, drive the same car, pick us up or whatever, and it would be all these questions. It was very interesting. I've been in a household where I saw a woman make more than a man in my, in my upbringing. I've seen situations where my mother was the one who was working and my stepfather was like a, was the homemaker at that time. I've seen all different dynamics of gender roles. And so when I hear this type of language, and it might seem like to some of you all like, wow, we, we, I, white people, because let's get white people together real quick, y'all. White people, don't do the wow. People really say that. Stop it because y'all say this shit. It may not be you, okay, boo, but your cousin, your brother, your uncle didn't say some shit like that, okay? Stop being shocked. This shit is real. People will try you. People will be disrespectful. Just want to put that on the table. Let's not keep acting like this shit is like, wow, because it can, because even those reactions give off gaslight signals to, to folks that have those experiences, like myself and so many other people. It's just that Black people don't have all day to express and tell every story about every single thing that happens to them. So... I am. A, I have the ability to have a podcast to share some of these experiences, but I know there are people listening to this that have those experiences. When they bought that new car, when they got that new house, when they got that new promotion, we, we are always being questioned and surveilled for the accomplishments we fucking have. And the funny part is, is that for those people that eat up respectability politics, notice that even in situations when black excellence and achievement is happening, we're still being surveilled like criminals. So it don't matter in this country whether you're a black person doing well, doing bad, or doing crime, or doing good. You're going to still deal with the same types of issues. Just letting y'all know that the respectability does not change. I'm, I've never been blinded by that. But there are a lot of people that tell me, oh, I want to do upper mobility because that's going to stop white people. White people go white people, y'all. Period. The white gaze is always going to be ever so present in our livelihoods. You just got to be able to be in a position where sometimes you can set them straight if they come at you too much, or you can have the ability to stunt on them and keep it the fuck moving. But whatever you're doing, do you, right? So, yes, I've, I've seen some interesting things happen. But like I said, I'm silent money. I have a little fun, but I'm silent money. Some of these people, don't be loud money out here, y'all. Don't be loud money. Be loud about the issues, but don't be loud money. It's not cute. It's just not cute, especially when you're at a certain age. There's people out here about to be 40 years old cutting up like that. Like, I, I have a little bit more grace for people in their 20s, right? Because it, it makes sense. I get it. I know where I was when I was in my early 20s. But now that I'm 30 and I'm married, and, you know, I've been doing this for a minute, I'm not in that space. Like, I just, I'm just over that era, that whole, like, ugh. And so when I see grown-ass people do that or, or stuff, I'm looking at them like, and you ain't got no friends, do you? No one told you that wasn't cute? No one told you just to be yourself? Listen, you can get things across without having to do to wave a big old banner saying, look at me, look at me, I got this, I got this. But what do I know? I'm just, you know, this black person out here. Just, you know, 
doing things for free, I guess. So, <laughs> last but not least, before I transition to the other topics. Yes, y'all, this is a super episode. Sink your teeth in, reflect, go back and rewind segments because we're, we're here today. I have time today. I have time. This is the season two finale. Okay, this is a super episode. Get your life. Um... So I am going to be hosting the New Leaders Council Convention um, from July 21st to July 26th. Yes, I will. it's in Philadelphia. I am the convention host. This is the first ever convention I've ever been a host of. I, I never knew conventions won't even have them near the podium. But I will be the convention chair of the 2022 New Leaders Council Convention here in Philadelphia. Tickets are on sale now. Check it out. Link in bio. Go to New Leaders Council. Check the tag. I made a Facebook post, uh, Instagram post, Twitter. It's all over social media. Check it out. NLC. Um, tickets are now on sale. There's going to be dope speakers, including Rebecca Reinhardt. Um, Rebecca Reinhardt is going to be a speaker. And you know she's one of my favorite people, um, public you know, officials in the city. Um, other great speakers are coming in town. Um, Aaron Haynes will be there. You all know Aaron, you know. Um, she'll be there. A lot of other folks will be there. A lot of special guests, a lot of people. This is a national convention. I haven't done anything like this in my entire life. So I'm super excited. This is like goals. Like, I, like I have a bunch of weird goals on my list, y'all. There's some stuff that y'all don't even know that I want to do or I've wanted to do that I've done that are like on my goals. Because we're like, well, what are you going to do now? Oh, trust baby. I have a couple of things on this list that I, that I'm definitely checking off. This was something that I've always wanted to do. Um, I never thought it would be for NOC. I always thought it was going to be for like NABJ and the groups. But, you know, NABJ right now is in its own little pickle. I did not know what other organization I would have an affinity with that would have a convention that would bring me out. But New Leaders Council, I'm class of 2019, the Philadelphia chapter. They are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that are really bringing up leaders, young, diverse, emerging leaders across the country to push progressive goals and ideals, to be all about inclusion and equity. It's an incredible organization. They have this wonderful program. I think I've talked about it already, but just to reiterate, um, they have a wonderful um, fellowship program that they do every year across major cities. So if you're in Houston, you're in New York, you're in Chicago, Philadelphia, other parts, there are there are chapters all over the country and you just apply. And if you get accepted, you're into this fellowship free of charge, free of cost, and you get all types of different leadership training and development skills. I mean, you learn how to do political campaigning. If you're interested in politics, if you're interested in being a better civil, a civic leader, civil participant, you want to build with like-minded people in a city that you haven't really, you know, been a part of, or you, let's say you've been in one industry, but you want to know other people in other industries, be a part of it. I joined, I was a 2019 fellow, and I also was a part of the board for two consecutive terms. Um, NLC was awesome. I was on the board for like two years, and it was a great, I was on the board, I was a fellow first, I was on the board afterwards, and it was a great opportunity. Um, I met people from different avenues, law, health, public service, education, uh, the academy, uh, all kind of different industries. And I still kept up with those relationships with those people to this day. Um, made some really great lasting friendships, um, have really great connections. And as a journalist, it was perfect for me because anytime I need to get the tea on something in some industry that I'm looking into, I always have a source of people that I can lean on to for that kind of support. So if you're really trying to build a real, legit, professional career network, this is it. And the joke is that uh, they're, these are pre-screened friends. Because you apply and these people get vetted, of course, and they apply, they get in the program. And so you know that the people that make it are like some of the top notch folks. So you build a connection with other like minded folks and people. I encourage people to apply. If you want to know, DM me about it or details about it. If you want to know more about NLC, New Leaders Council, check it out, Google it. Uh, come to the convention in Philly, in Philadelphia. There's special events happening all over. If you want to see me in person, take a selfie. Because some of y'all like go to events I do and see me. This is the top opportunity to do it. We're taking over Philadelphia that last week of July. It is going down. And then next week, the week after that, I'll be in New. I'll be in. Uh, I'll be in Vegas for the NABJ convention. So I'm going to be conventioning out the, as I push through this summer. But that is epic, and that was something I've been 
having to hold in for several weeks, like many other announcements. But I would rather be holding announcements in than just completely floating in space with no sense of purpose, direction, anything else. So, on to the topics. <laughs> finally, right? Finally. Um, January 6th. I, these hearings, man, I, I have to say that last week I did tell y'all I was getting a little bored, but they, they, they kept it spicy. Cassidy Hutchinson, okay, who was an aide to this, you know, Mark Meadows. This Meadows, this chief of staff to, to Trump, yo, this man needs to come to the hearings. I know he doesn't want to talk or whatever, but like, yo, we need to talk to Mr. Meadows because Mr. Meadows clearly, clearly know what's going on. So Cassidy Hutchinson, which is this young white woman in her 20s, who was a chief of staff. I, how did she get? Well, you know what? Trump definitely wasn't getting the best and brightest. But this woman, this this young woman is the chief of staff to Mark Meadows, who is the chief of, was the chief of staff to Trump. She basically testified and spilled all the tea. OK, on everything that was happening in, at, during that insurrection, talked about how belligerent Trump was, how he flipped tables through shit, ketchup was splattered on the walls, how he had these tincture tantrums, how he was fucking with the Secret Service, how he wanted to get them to drive him so he could be with his with his goons. Basically, he was trying to go out there with, where the protests were. He wanted to be with them. They was like, uh, uh, you got to get away from that, Mr. President. How crazy that the man is trying to protect you with Secret Service, you attacking him to get through. Apparently, the Secret Service people are going to put out some information to, 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 to provide, you know, some, some tips and things. But some people like Roger Moore, who is trash, um, has been coming out saying that this isn't true, that that this this is not this. Well, come testify then. If it's not true, take your ass over there to the hearings and go testify. Go talk to the, the, the January 6th commission. Go talk to them then. Since you got so much to say out here on Twitter and in, 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 the, in the media streets. So, a lot of people online have been calling her a hero. Don't. Stop calling her a hero. Stop calling her courageous. She was with the damn Trump administration to the very fucking end. And at the end of the day, she should have been not been a part of that. Like, you decide to work for this administration. So, I, your politics ain't all that for me. And now you decide the 11 o'clock hour to come out. Let me tell you about white people like her that do stuff like that. They're looking for a way to, one, get pardoned, right, to cover their ass. That's one. And two, to turn this into an opportunity to do a tell-all book. And, you know, I used to, as, a, as an author, because I can have, a, I can say this, I sometimes wonder, how do they have that many pages centered around one thing? It's like the book will be about everything tell all all of that like these people will flip for a book deal they'll flip for a documentary series i mean that's just how the business works so i just know that she did this so she can make herself a, have a moment so now she can then turn around get a book deal she can now get a documentary she can get her abc interview you know th this is what they do they're all pimping each other out trying to figure out the highest bidder so like mark meadows is probably one trying to legally cover his ass and then, after he covers his ass, then be able to turn around and flip on Trump and get some book. Like, that's all they're doing at this point. Like, everybody in this administration is looking for their deal. Well, you know what? I think a lot of people are Trump fatigued. It's only so many stupid ass books we're going to want to read. And to the national mainstream media, can y'all stop trying to glorify all these people? Can you stop trying to push this shit? Can you stop trying to push this shit? Like, you're, this is the, these are the issues I have with journalism as a journalist. Okay. Because a lot of y'all want to bash the quote-unquote media. Here's how to get them in check, like I'm about to. And you all are not even on that level. Let's, let's let, get into it. I, the, in journalism, there is a machine, right? There's a whole machine. There is PR giving press releases. Press releases are going to journalists. Journalists are taking information, deciding to make news of it. And then the news amplify the message of these people then they get to sell shit people like the regular americans and readers and consumers read the shit consume the shit formulate ideas and the cycle continues at some point we have to be better motherfucking pipelines of this information like we have to be able to take a moment and say hmm should we really give this person a platform to really sit up here 
and, 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 and spew lies or, you know, just go out here and promote themselves and their books? Should we just use, give them an opportunity to get a, a space to blow up their ego and get them on fucking lists and make them celebrities? Like, we have the power. Journalists have so much power. We have so much power. Okay, we have the ability to make and break people. And I'm sitting here like, why are we investing so much fucking resources making pieces of trash something that the public can consume? And then when the public worships these people and do dumb shit in the name of these people, then we turn around and cover that shit too. Like we don't know how that started. It starts with us. It starts with us. It starts with us making decisions in our newsroom, saying to ourselves, hmm, you know what? I know they keep asking for this attention, but we ain't about to give them that because we don't care. You know, could you imagine how many times, you know, if these news channels and stations just decided to say, you know, we're not going to air that Trump rally because he ain't saying nothing. Because we know that Trump is going to use our tools and weaponize them against us in the public. Jeff Zucker at CNN was obsessed with, with Aaron Trump so much that he was excited about the ratings because at the end of the day, sadly, journalism is a business and people will use gross capitalism to exploit the business for their own interest. But then that's how democracy got eroded. That's how people got killed. That's how people got fucked up. That's how buildings got demolished. Like This is the shit that you all are responsible for. And I got to be very clear, this is white mainstream media. Because while they were de debating on whether or not they can call Donald Trump's behavior treason or define him as a racist, black journalists like me been calling Trump a racist. Black journalists like me were like, you know what, I'm not about to cover Trump that much. I did it. If you Google how many articles I wrote about Trump, I promise you, it is probably less than 10. I have probably have done less than 10 stories on Trump over the past five, six years that focused on Trump. About less than 10. I, I, I didn't, I can count, I, I think I remember most of those stories because they were very specific things that were done. And, and like, I, I just didn't care about him like that. And I remember telling my newsroom, like some of the publications I worked with, right? I told them, listen, if you're looking for that black person that's gonna talk about Trump for you, like, I'm not that dude. Like, I know that you're trying to, like, I'm not about to keep pushing Trump's ego. I was able to have a career. Because I'm going to throw some shade. Some of these journalists out here, you know, Maggie, Hyberstein, and all them, right? Their whole careers were predicated off of Trump. They made their whole business about Trump. Now they're writing books about Trump. And it's like, how many fucking books do we need about Trump? And how many of y'all careers are based on these people? One thing I learned in the business is to never obsess over a trend or of a person. Like, I'm never going to be a journalist that's all about one person and make my whole career about them. Like, people will say, well, what about Justin Timberlake? I didn't make my whole career about Justin Timberlake. Justin Timberlake made his whole career about me at some point where he kept on bringing up the issue, making songs about it. And so, yes, it was call and respond. He said something, I responded. You will find out very quickly if you follow that, that Justin Timberlake situation that towards, the, towards that entire saga, it was him doing things and me responding to it based off of me being referenced in the situation. In each of those situations, I mean, yes, I called him out and, and that was in 2016 and that was a moment that blew up. But after that, all the things that Justin Timberlake did were basically put in positions where I had to respond. Like he talks about the situation in an interview with Zane Lowe. He talks about it in a song. He, it comes up in the Janet documentary and the Britney apology. And the media began to run Statement saying, you know, that Justin had five years to, you know, to address this and he did it. And so, like, basically, I became a part of that narrative. And <laughs> at some point, I was like, okay, I'm tired of this. Or we all got over it, right? And at the end of the day, I won the war. I mean, we don't talk about Justin to make the same anymore. Congrats. Thanks. Right? Thanks to y'all. Thanks to me. Thanks to all of us, right? Um, shout out to Black Twitter. But that's what I'm saying. Like, there are some people that literally made their career centered around Trump. And then when the Trump train began to fade, their whole identity was lost. 
Like they don't even know what they're going to write about next or, or how much their career was. I never wanted to be a journalist that had my career fixated on one particular issue or person. I've had eras. I've had chapters, but I've never made my career only in one particular issue. Like I have the Sean King era. I've, I've covered Sean King. I've covered Mayor Kenny. I've covered Gabriel Racism. These are all chapters in my career, but that's not my career. That's not just my career, right? And that was something that was important to me. A lot of journalists do not do that. And I think the problem is, is that people are turning scandals into hustles. Like it becomes their hustle to be fixated on one person all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to try to like get a come up. And it's like, that is so sad. I wish journalism was treated like a public service that was funded like such so that we did not have to, you know, like, I mean, if they put as much money into some of these police departments, like New York's police department is $10 billion. If they put half of that money into the journalism industry in New York City so that they didn't have to sensationalize and over embellish things to make money, could you imagine the quality of journalism in New York City would be? Could you imagine if they did it in other cities, like they put that much money into the money they put in cops into media as a public service, how many people could actually have decent livings, people would have more integrity, there'd be more ethics, there'd be more accountability, people would stick to the facts more. I mean, I just could y'all just imagine if that was if journalism was treated like the public service that it is, rather than a public service that's to be funded by corporate dollars and consumer dollars. Like I just hate that. I hate it. I hate it. It's my it's my biggest complaint about journalism. I, I just think the structure and the system is just there. That and objectivity, because objectivity is bullshit. But I talk about that all the time. But I just wanted to be clear. So I'm not crazy about this Cassidy Hutchinson woman. I'm like, you know, thank you for telling some information. Thank you for spilling the beans. Moving on. So moving on, um, there is another unfortunate death of an unarmed black man, this time in Ohio. His name is Jalen Walker. And he was a DoorDash driver who was shot at 90 times, but was shot physically 60 times to death. The video has now been released. Let me tell you all something right the fuck now. I have not watched that video. Just like I did not watch the George Floyd video. I've never seen the full George Floyd video. I haven't. I know what happened. I've read what happened. Just like I just told you. What just happened? I don't have to see that video. I decided many years ago, I think after Sandra Bland, that I was no longer going to watch these videos. I was no longer going to watch them. I was no longer going to share them. Stop sharing these videos. Stop watching these videos. Respect the dead. If the family chooses to grieve and see that, that is their choice. But the, the fact that we consistently share this trauma porn I am telling you that I have not, I had to block some people this weekend because I'm sick of the, did you see this? I'm sick of the tagging me two videos and comments of, of, of fucked up shit happening in the world. Stop doing that. Don't do that to me. Don't do that to your friends. Don't do it to yourself. Like, Black men, black people in general do not need to see another one of ours slain. I don't need to see it. I don't need to see it to believe it. This this show and tell shit has to fucking stop. You can tell without motherfucking showing. Tell the people. But you don't got to show the people. You don't got to show me. Stop it. I really mean that. I, I don't want to see the video. Don't tag me to the video. If you do, I'm blocking you, period. Like, I don't want to expose myself to that. And at some point, we all have to create our boundaries. And I think a lot of people just really, like, the way that people, I, I had a real conversation with someone in my DMs that did it. Um, fortunately, Instagram, which is rare, had gave me the content warning. So I, I figured what it was, and so I didn't click on it, right? And so I said to them, why the fuck would you send this to me? I, yeah, I, you know, if they screenshot me cursing them out, I don't give a fuck because I will tell you, yeah, I did it. I just didn't even say I wasn't even proper. I was so annoyed. I was just like, why the fuck are you sending this to me? I just said it just like that. I, I had no manners, y'all. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry. I was pissed. So they said back to me, I mean, 
I just want to just talk about like how the police are just out here killing, you know, black men in America and that it just the killings won't stop. And I said to this person, and did you think that I had to see that for you to tell me that? Like, what are we into? Well, I mean, did you see how the cop, yeah. why do we have to treat this like a fucking NFL playback? Like, why are we treating this like an NFL playback? Like, oh, look at this. Look, look at what happened. Blah, 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 blah. Like, why are we treat like, like, what are we, this, someone got killed. A son, a, 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 a brother, a, a cousin, a mentor, possibly a father. Oh, uh, you know, these are people, humanity, you fucking humanity. Like, no. Heaven forbids anything happens to myself or my friends. I'm telling you right the fuck now. It does not have to be done this way. It does not. Stop doing it. Respect these people. Stop showing the video. Stop it. Because at this point, let me tell you something. If you're a person that needs to see this video to grieve, to process this, what this tells me already is that you don't give a fuck. Let's just let's, let's, let's start there. You don't give a fuck about this person. You don't give a fuck because how many more people have died? There's been... Hundreds of videos over the years. And, and, and you don't have to see this video. And you don't have to share this video. Black people know. Just because the black person you know didn't make a Facebook post about it or Twitter about it, trust me, they know. And if they don't know, guess what? What difference does it make? I'm going to go there. Because what's going to happen, right? Police are going to do an investigation. They might, you know, charge someone. There's going to be a trial and then maybe that person is going to get let off because the likelihood of them getting let off is very high, right? So they get let off and then, you know, protests happen. And then what happens next? Because you all want to keep policing in this country. You want to keep policing at the level it is. So it's, 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 it's sad. I hope that family get a fast settlement. I hope that whoever did it do, do get Go to jail, but are we going to call it justice? I don't know. I don't know what to call it. I just think we're at a point where I'm just tired of people faking it. I'm tired of the performance. I'm tired of reactions. I'm reacting the fuck out. You know, I'm just at a point of trying to provide advice and reasons to people to get the help they need. I want to point people to resources, to process. I want to, you know, look at ways to get people to try to seek some level of accountability where it is. But all this, look at this, look at this, did you see this? Like, what do you want me to do? I sometimes feel like people treat me like I'm, you know, a puppet, like a jack in the box. Like there's this sense of, oh, this happened. I'm going to get your take on this. I mean, it's one thing to talk about entertainment shit, but it's another thing to talk about trauma and black people dying. A black person got killed. What do you want? Fucking poem? Like there are some black people that, are all about that because that's what they want to do to create their identity. Like, that's how they express themselves. Like, they're going to sing a song. They're going to do all these things. And people are going to treat it like art and, and feel good. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm not built for that. I'm not that person. That's not what you're going to get from me. You're not going to get this instant, oh my God, you know, this is da da. Like, I, you know, sometimes I just sit and I relax. I, sometimes I just, just process the shit. Sometimes I take a break. Sometimes I just, just escape because it's a normal thing. And so there are some black people that are robots for, for, for commerce that are always going to be in this mindset of they got to say something immediately. They got to blah, 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 everything, everything, everything. And while it, it do seem like that for me sometimes, if you pay attention, I'm very selective about what I respond to. I'm not rooted in trauma. Like, I don't jump up for trauma. I don't ambulance chase trauma. I don't. I, I'm not looking for the next black death to sit up and, you know, have all of this, you know, all of that. I just, uh, I don't. And if, you're, and if you're asking black people what they think about it, stop asking them what they think about it. Because it's what they thought when the last black person died, right? Did someone just die like two weeks ago from the cops? I mean, I can't even keep up. I keep, you know, I, it, it's so many people, right? Amir Locke, you know, like, I mean, how many, I mean, you know, what are we, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we saying? Like, we've done this already. 2020, right? 
summer of 2020, right? We were, it was, it, the city was in a different look. The country was in a different look two years ago. And then y'all went back to doing the same shit y'all been doing. So, that's that, right? Don't know what to say. Just what I've been saying. That's why we have the podcast. Just, you know, whatever my response is, is whatever I said about Mir Lock. Whatever I said about the other black and brown people that have been killed by the police over the years. Whatever I've said about them is the same thing I have to say about this. It, my position hasn't changed. If it has, I'll let you all know. But it probably isn't. Like, fuck the police. Elected officials are whack. They're not doing enough. <sighs> White people are not doing enough. A lot of people are not doing enough. I think that's all I can say right now, right? I mean, what else? There is no thing, there's no such thing as a good cop in a racist system. I've been saying that already. That's what I'll say. That's all I can say. As they say, good night and good luck. So, Supreme Court decisions have been a shit show already, as you all know. Um, they are stopping the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, from basically doing their job. Like, they're regulating that they cannot go as far as regulate around green gas emissions or greenhouse gas emissions. So they're, they're regulating on that now. So now EPA, you know, the whole, everyone who was trying to do a lot to address climate change, um, that's out the window now. Yep, that's the bullshit there. Um, now they're allowing, you know, people to force, you know, prayer in schools. So there's a lot of shit like that, um, going on. Um, and that's annoying because it's just kind of like, okay, so we're talking about everything else going on in the world, but we're not taking the time to focus on, like, I mean, Kaepernick couldn't take a knee, but these people can force prayer. I guess Tra separation of church and state is a joke in this country, sadly. And, and they're just doing whatever they want because they have the power. Because, you know, this fucking president. Um, speaking of this president, so I saw that CNN interview. I think it was Dana Bash with uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. I don't know if you've seen that interview, but you can. It's on YouTube. It's quite interesting. And they were talking to her about Biden's stances on Roe v. Wade. And there's been a lot of conversations about it. And I, listen, here's my thing. This is, the, you know, Kamala's situation right now is a textbook example of DEI hires that backfire. They put her in this position as VP. And she's just kind of having to go with the flow. You can tell that she knows shit is not right, but she's just there. And it's so upsetting because there's been questions about whether he's going to run. And she just said, look, me and Biden are going to be on the ticket in 2024. That's it. And there were people talking about her being next. And I'm like, mm. what, what, did, what, did, what did AOC say on CNN at the time? She says, you know, we'll see or something. <laughs> she didn't say yes or no. That, that's kind of my energy right now. Uh, but I'm going to have to be 100. Bernie Sanders can't run for re-election. Like, that's it, Bernie. It's over. Let it go. It's over, okay? It, it, it's got to be somebody else. Um, but, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be that person because I know people expect that from me, right? Of course, Ernest is thinking about, or, or of course, people like Ernest, right? Or, or those progressives are thinking about another presidential pick outside of Biden. I'm not, I'm not, listen, I'm being quiet. Listen, what it's going to be is what it's going to be. But this ain't it right now. That's all I'm saying. This right here, this ain't it. I'm not, I'm not feeling this. Um, there's got to be, there's just, this is not enough. And so what's funny is that after consistently dragging his feet, Biden is cap now supporting the filibuster in the event to codify Roe v. Wade. So after all that filibuster talk, he now has, has this exception to, 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 to the filibuster, to about to ending the filibuster. Let me be clear. To ending the filibuster temporarily to codify Roe v. Wade. 
See that, y'all? That's what we call a backpedal. I told y'all. I Listen, he, everybody knew there is no other way to get that done. And my whole thing is, let's end the filibuster, y'all. Let's end it. Let's get it the fuck done. Let's end this filibuster. Let, let's stop the, the, the bullshit. Shit needs to get done. Okay? We need to go straight majority. All this two-thirds, all the, cut it out. We need to we need to get the votes. It's just it's just time. People are literally dying. Rights are being completely reversed. And this these voters are gonna remember: did the president do everything in his power to give people back their rights? We're not even getting new rights now. We're losing constitutional rights now. Like we're so behind, we're not even making inroads upward. We're actually getting behind. We're we're trying to preserve the shit we already have. Like I'm over here asking for the Equality Act. Look like we can't even get the Equality Act. We better make sure we keep gay marriage before we can even talk about, you know, civil rights across the board. I mean, it's like we're at the point where we can't even push forward. We got to preserve back. It's like, oh, my God, like this is not a good look. So, I mean, I guess, I guess Biden. I guess that that's where I'm at with him. That's where I'm at with the administration, I guess. So... A lot of you have been asking me about, you know, Beyonce's single, all the new music, all that. So I'm excited. I hope that she's going to get up them charts. I think she's going to have a big hit on her hands. I think she's finally going to have a moment. Um, I, I think Break My Soul is a banger. And I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, there's a lot of buzz, a lot of press. Everyone's talking about it. It, um, and we're going to see what, you know, what's going on. So they, you know, for starters, Beyonce's Break My Soul is the first song in 26 years to debut in the R&B hip hop airplay chart top 10. The superstar's new single, according to Billboard, begins on the top 10 and it's, it's the first song in 26 years of debut in the R&B hip hop airplay chart for the top 10. I wow. Wow. That that's yeah. I mean, we're hearing different things. I'm looking forward to what's going to happen. It it got in the top 20 at number 15 last week, but there's a lot of buzz that it's eyeing top 10 positions. I mean, top five positions. Um, and, you know, it's, we're going to see what it's going to do. I, I think it has position to it. I think it has a big deal. Um, but, you know, people are saying things like, um, what is that? Uh, it's, a, it, you know, that dance music does really well during the recession. And that's a really big deal. You know, when songs, you know, can, can, you know, dance music does well during a recession because we're headed to a recession. But like historically pop dance music is very popular during recessions because people want to shake off the energy and, and it feel good. So we're, we're looking at some interesting things, but I mean, I hope she could be able to chop, uh, top those charts. Um, we'll see. We'll see what is given. Um, but I'm a I'm a I'm a big fan. I heard that Chris Brown wanted to do a collaboration with um with I guess all this other stuff. All I'm gonna say is mm 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 Beyonce. We don't need we don't need a Chris Brown collaboration. We don't spare us, baby. Spare us. I, I don't, we don't need it. I hope that she doesn't have them on the album. We don't need more disappointments. Because let me tell you what disappointed me this week. And I haven't said anything about it on social. Because, you know, I love her. But this Cardi B collaboration with Kanye West. This song, her new song, Hot Shit. is called Hot Shit. Well, it's not really that hot to me. It's a little bit called, I'm going to call it cold shit. Because I'm really upset. Because it's not hot. Because, no. I mean, first of all, sonically and musically, right? Cardi's great. She did not need the feature with them. I actually like when Cardi does songs solo. Cardi's solo 
bops are just good by themselves. Like Cardi has the kind of talent where I can listen to her solo and enjoy a song without having a thousand features. I find that a lot of features she do, like people, when she's not when she's featured on people's songs, when people are featuring her songs, they actually kind of like dampen the song. I, I like her by herself. She could do that whole song by herself. I did not need to hear Kanye. Reaction to the song has been very tepid. A lot of people are not like super crazy about it or or um or or in, impressed or excited. It it was very low fuse. She did not do a music video. She just dropped the single. And it just was underwhelming, like that Kanye. And Kanye was also not good on it either. Um, so, you know, there's room out here. You know, I thought that there was going to be a trifecta. Like, okay, Beyonce number one, then, you know, Cardi next. I mean, she might still, you know, be doing well on the charts because summer music has been kind of up and down. But, you know, it's interesting what's going on out here. Um, you know, interesting. I heard there was the Essence Fest going on, um, which they haven't had a festival in like three years, I believe, since the pandemic. And a lot was going on. Slutty Vegan, the CEO, Pinky Cole, she's engaged to Derek Hayes, who has that like cheesesteak place. Interesting. Cute couple. They pro he proposed, to, I guess they proposed to each other at Essence Fest, which is like the capital, like it's like the Black Women's Convention. Like if you take, like, if, if, like to me, Essence Festival is like the Black Women's Convention. Um, you know, if you see, if you saw Girls Trip for those, saw Girls Trip, Essence Festival is like epic for them. It's, it's, it's a, it's a thing. I know a lot of men who go too, but like, it's, it's, it's really the black women's convention. And I say this, no shade, of course, this is, it's beautiful. It's like a lot of great artists. I mean, like Janet Jackson headlined, Nicki Minaj also performed. Um, I think they had Summer Walker perform. They had a, a lot of other artists. Um, but I was like, Nicki Minaj? And I heard the perform. I, I heard it wasn't. It was. There was mixed thoughts about the performance and some of the drama. But you know, Nikki's at that point where she's just you know. She just. It's, it's always going to be some. It's going to always be a situation. Um, also, uh, Jasmine Sullivan performed as well. So that Caesar Superdome apparently was super lit. <laughs> But it was a good time. A good time by all. A lot of people got pictures with Janet, which I'm just like, oh, like, I am so overdue. I've been wanting to see Janet forever. Um, my time will come. It will come eventually. But like, oh, I saw all the pictures. I was like, damn, they love that. Like, people had a lot of fun, for sure. Um, as they should. I'm happy that people are going back to conventions and festivals and things of that nature. So... R. Kelly got sentenced to 30 years, y'all. And Glenn, Gillian Maxwell, um, or Maxine, or whatever, I, I haven't kept up with her that much. Uh, you know, she's the one that was, you know, being a, an assistant to Jeffrey Epstein, helping him with his human trafficking, sexual abuses. You know, that woman. She got sentenced to 20 years. Listen. It is what it is. It is what it is. We've been waiting. We've been waiting. We've been waiting. And it's time. It's time. It was a long it was long overdue. You know. Um and this is what has to happen. You know? Um basically given the sentencing, it's very unlikely that these people will come out alive um though it looks like you know based on their age they're probably going to be spending the rest of their life behind bars i heard cosby is still out here trying to make appearances and all of that jazz disgusting and you know i'm not not at all impressed i mean He's out here doing whole settlements and shit. $500,000 settlement for raping a girl in a Playboy mansion, apparently, decades ago. But there's been a lot of other things going on with him in general. But, like, he's so fucking old and, you know, it's just... Uh, don't want to be that person, but counting the days. Because I, I'm, I'm just... The fact that his team and people are still trying to keep this man up. Like, keep this man, like, up in higher regard. He's... We, we, like, no. He's a predator. He's trash. I No. Who gives a fuck? 
And he has a cult of fans, and that's celebrity for you, but please, that man is trash. Um, so I, I have I have nothing, nothing nice to say at all. <sighs> On to the next. So for people who are acting like they just cannot not listen to like it's hard to resist R. Kelly music. I just want to remind you all that Usher is still out here killing it in his 40s, singing his hits. That NPR Tiny Desk concert, that was probably the best Tiny Desk concert ever um, because Usher is still hot physically, musically, sonically, vocally. Um, and so the people out there who were acting like Usher was like in an Omarion category where this guy couldn't sing live, I'm happy that he reminded them that just because he can dance, he can sing. I mean, just because he can dance really well and he looks good and he's, he was also very much into sex appeal, that that never meant that he didn't have vocals. Usher can sing. Like, sang. He can sing. Like, vocally, he is talented. Like, when you, like, Brandy, Beyonce, and Usher are from a different planet. They are light years ahead of us in taste, innovation, creativity, songwriting, abstract for one of those artists, uh, vocals, all of that. They are phenomenal. You know, I don't know what the next generation's iteration is of Brandy, Beyonce, and Usher. I don't know who, what trio this generation this next generation, like, can claim. Because that's who I grew up listening to. They had it all. They had the ability to be sexual and fun. They had the ability to... They still have that ability, right? But those are legends now. I think it's fair to put them in a legendary you know, box. They've been in the game over 25 years. Yes, they started off very young. They were child stars. But they've been in the game... And it's time to put some respect on their names. Like, they're no longer young and artists where we have to debate. Those are legends. Those are legends. Those are legends that could sing. We're, you know, acting is subjective for some of them. But they were triple talents. They had multitudes of levels of talent. Entrepreneur, arts. Like, these are bona fide legends now. Like, they have proven their, their worth, their impact. They can sit beside Janet Jackson. They can sit at the table with the other legendary children. They are deemed tens across the board, those three. And I, I and there's no more debating about Brandy, right? We're not. Brandy is the vocal Bible. But Brandy has done some trailblazing shit. Brandy is still doing things that other artists wish they can. She is an inspiration for so many people in the current music industry, her iconic status, her impact, like Brandy's a legend. Let's just give her her roses today. Beyonce, no conversation. Usher, like the fact that he is still being compared to contemporaries that aren't even doing a half of what he's doing is already there. Like when the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame comes for Usher, for being like, it's time to get them in there ASAP. Like Jay-Z's in there, you know, Janet's in there. It's time to get them in there now. Like I, I think... They're all trying to figure out how to measure. I think Beyonce needs about five more years. I think Usher is about to be eligible very soon, actually, um, because his solo album came out. I think it's about it's going to be his time. So I think Brandy, her time is coming very soon, too. I mean, they're at that 25 year mark, y'all. Quarter of a century. Yes. Yes. I was listening to Full Moon yesterday. Oh, my goodness. Full Moon. Brandy's Full Moon. Like... The, the bedrock of contemporary R&B, as we know it today. That, Aaliyah self-titled, of course, Janet Jackson's All For You, Mary J. Blige's No More Drama. Those albums were bedrocks to contemporary R&B. Ashanti self-titled laid the foundation for contemporary R&B as we know it. Dangerous in Love as well came a year, a couple years later. But the early contemporary R&B albums, they laid the foundation for that. For that type of sound. Like R&B didn't have to be like Alicia Keys. Like Alicia Keys is a classical R&B artist. They were making music. Usher. Eight, 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 seven. Wait, was it? Eight, oh, yeah. Eight, seven, oh, one. Because 
it was definitely not the 2020s. <laughs> I forget. I remember it, it was the album A701. Yeah, A701. So, oh my God. A710, y'all, came out 21 years ago in August. Because the album date was August 7, 2001. That album came out. That was his third album. Everybody forgets that he had that like really weird like self-titled album that no one talks about. Then My Way came out and then um A701 came out. Um it's his third studio album. Everybody forgets that he had the album called he had an album um a live album called Live, but that wasn't a studio album. My Way was his sophomore album. But he had a self-titled album that came out in 1994. So Usher is long overdue, y'all. Like, My Way came out in 1997. So this is the 25th anniversary of My Way, which came out September 16th, 1997, which had Nice and Slow, You Make Me Wanna. That was, to me, the real Usher album. But he did have an album that came out in 94. So Usher was like young as hell when that album came out. It was a major flop. The album debuted at 167 on the Billboard uh, 200 albums chart. He was super young. And that was when he was with LaFace and Arista. Puff Daddy was the executive producer. But the problem with that album was that he was super sexualized in the album. Too young. Like Usher was like, you know, he was born. Like in 19, 19, 1978. So that would have technically been, he would have been like 14, 13 years old when that album came out because he's a Libra. So he was like 13, like, yeah, he was 13 years old when that album came out. I'm just shocked that there were artists that, but I guess there's a lot of young artists out now. But like the fact that he was doing sexual type music and all of that. Like at thirteen, as a man, as a young, well, sorry, as a young man, as a, as a teen, as a boy, like that's wild. Usher has seen some things. He's been in the game since he was, since nineteen ninety four. So, that means that, ooh, ooh, Usher, baby, no. So Usher is gonna be forty four. He'll be forty five next year, but he's gonna be forty four this year. This man has been in the game for a long time. Because 14, 44, that means he's been in the industry for like 30 years. The fact that he's been able to keep it together is a blessing. Because, oh, goodness. But, you know, Usher's had his moments. But here I stand, great album, underrated. Anyway, he performed at NPR Tiny Desk Concert. All his hits. Um, all the talent. I mean, everyone talks about confessions, but y'all. We're not going to act like Here I Stand was not great. We're not going to act like A701 wasn't incredible. Like, he's had a bunch of grams. What I remember about A701 was that every song off that album started with you. Ugh, Libras are so creative. They're minds. But he had every... It's a little corny, but also very cool. Like, all of the tracks off of that album was um, started with you. Um, like you remind me, you got it bad, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Everything was, um, was, was listed. It was like, you turn, um, you don't have to call. You got it bad. You remind me. Everything started with you. That was what made that album unique. You know, um, he won some Grammys. He did a lot of stuff. He did, he did his thing. So, you know, Confessions comes out, and of course, that's like the blockbuster, the blockbuster hit, you know, for him. Um, of course, you know, he just killed it. But when he performed at Tiny Desk, I just was reminded of how many hits he had. And somebody said this very well. It was um very popular guy on Twitter. He said that the thing about Usher in this conversation around verses is that Usher has 10 songs that you know, 10 songs that Chris Brown fans know, 10 songs that Chris Brown's family know, 10 so like everybody knows 10 songs by Usher. The same can't be saying, said about Chris Brown. Everybody don't know 10 songs by Chris Brown that are worthy of conversation. I mean, 
everybody don't. Like I do, right? I know some songs by Chris Brown, but when you're talking about legendary status, there are a bunch of people out here that probably can recall more Usher songs than Chris Brown. And that's because Usher has been in the industry twice as long than Chris Brown. So there should be, I mean, listen, Usher's album, My Way, is 25 years old. Usher's career is almost as old as, old as Chris Brown's age. Like Chris Brown, Usher is the blueprint for Chris Brown. Like there would be no Chris Brown without Usher. Everyone is always saying that it's Michael Jackson for Chris Brown. This reminds me of when Nikki always kept talking about Lauren Hill rather than acknowledging Little Kim because they were too similar in her mind because she was like basically copycatting Little Kim. So she would always say Lauren, Lauren Hill, this, Lauren Hill, that, which let's be clear, Lauren Hill is legendary. And Lauren Hill was at Essence Fest, which is dope. But the thing about Lauren Hill and Nikki, I don't see the comparison. I don't see the influence of Lauren Hill and Nicki Minaj across the catalog as much as Lil' Kim. I mean, clearly there's some influence, right? Of course. But I see more Trina and Lil' Kim than I see Lauren Hill in Nicki Minaj's catalog. When I look at Chris Brown, I see more Usher than Michael Jackson. That is not a controversial take. That is just a fact. When I look at Usher's aesthetic first of all what i appreciate about usher is that usher carved out his own identity in a world where michael jackson existed like michael jackson was still out when when usher was in the industry like they i mean it's wild that usher started his career in 99 94 so he was out doing music and recording music when janet was still in her big huge prime madonna was still in her prime he was before britney he was before beyonce he was before i mean he was right around the time as brandy brandy him touched around the same time mary j blige he was up there chilling with diddy when he was 14 13 this is a kid prodigy we're talking about appreciation libra appreciation day for usher because too many people have really not understood Usher. Like Usher needs a documentary. It's time for an Usher documentary. I don't need a biopic because y'all gonna ruin it, but it is time for a real Usher documentary. Like the way that we're talking about Mariah Carey and tell all books, we need an Usher book. Like we need, like people really need to talk about it because it, it, it's, it's disgusting how folks have really forgotten his long, longevity and like everybody just talks about confessions yes confessions was incredible it was magnificent it is one of the highest selling r&b contemporary r&b albums of this decade i think maybe the most selling one of this gen of this century it is pivotal it is consequential to, to the direction of r&b music and and what we know of it like it is uh it is a serious and very important album in music history and black music history and pop music it is an important album you know no one ever says it about anything that chris brown does with any of his albums there is no chris brown album that is like this is an important album in the canon it is no one's ever going to say that because it's not that it's redundant it's a lot of things but it's not that so there's like I guess Chris Brown was doing some interviews to promote that album that like no one's talking about. Like no one's talking about Breezy. Is Breezy even on the charts? Are are, are people like you know even have people forgotten about it? Like I'm just trying to figure out what happened. But I heard that first week sales projections for his album were super low. I mean he's put out a lot of albums. But I don't think anybody's really feeling them like that. I, I don't know. I, I'm not hearing. Maybe will it be on the charts? Um, you know, are we? Are we? Are we? Are we bad? So what? I, I just heard the news. So apparently he's debuting at number four. Bad Bunny is now back at number one on the Billboard charts with his single "On Verano Senti," which is a really good album. So Bad Bunny, even though Bad Bunny been hit, Bad Bunny's been on the charts for several weeks. Chris Brown just came in with 72,000 equivalent album sales. 
And it's his 12th album. Uh, you know, it's his 12th top 10 album on the Billboard 200, which is plausible. But he's an issue of where quantity does not mean quality. He produces a lot of music, but a lot of it is not good. It's really not. Like about every album, like every album he's doing, well, he may have one or two maybe good real banger songs that people are going to remember, but I can't even remember anything he's done. So it's, it's, it's you know, why are we comparing him to Usher? I just, I hear a lot of that on the internet and it just makes me annoyed. So I'm happy that the NPR Tiny Desk, which you can go watch online, there's a popular meme right now where he's doing the confessions and he's doing the watch this with his eyes and everyone's making like jokes and memes of it. I did one myself, I did a couple. But like that that you know, that's you know, there's he's one of a kind, Usher is. I'm an Usher stand, love him, you know, through thick and thin, no pun intended. He's 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 done well for himself. Speaking of things that are just like ugh, so Cynthia Revo, who is a Grammy Award winning, Emmy Award winning, Tony Award winning actress. She does not have an Oscar yet, but she's been nominated for an Oscar, right? She played Harriet Tubman in uh, Harriet, and she also was nominated for a Best Original Song in addition to that um, performance. She didn't win, which was, in my opinion, made sense. Well, she has come out as bisexual, and... If you've been listening to my podcast, you would know that's no surprise over here. I am getting a little annoyed with the way that some celebrities are now making it a thing to do the out coming out in this bold cover, front cover story type of way. I'm not, as a, as a queer person, I can recognize when I see people in our community that are or folks that are like that will manipulate media or to to or to use their identity in a way to try to garner some level of sympathy, attention, to promote things, and it's almost like this is not this is not it, right? Like there are some people that come out and say, "Look, I'm gay. It is what it is." But like to have the whole photo shoot to do this reveal in this way in 2022, it's just like. I'm not, I, good, you're living your truth, whatever, great. But like, at some point, it's like, it just gets, it, get, it gets capitalistic a little bit, right? That for the right price, for the right camera, for the right lighting, for the right promotional tour, for the right opportunity to be, become more relevant in certain conversations, I'll put this on the table when the time comes so this could be, politically convenient and expedient for me to be able to push something because we know Cynthia Revo must be doing something right there must be an album coming something's coming from her because clearly she wants to put this on the table I just hate that I just hate that that's becoming the theme and I'm seeing a lot of it happen and it's just kind of like what the, if we're in a place where we want to normalize people from the LGBTQI community we have to stop putting like these bumper light lights on coming outs, like coming outs, like what is that? Like I hate it. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I just, you know. So for starters, no one's surprised because literally for like the past two years, right, Cynthia Revo and Lena Waithe, right, who is also queer, they've been going out to award shows together, like left and right. Like she's wearing the uh, Cynthia's wearing the gown, Lena's wearing the the tux. And they're like looking booed up, like they're going out, and it's like they're they're not going, they're, they're they're literally going out, and like I'm like, who asks for this? Who asks? The, like it, we already knew. It's kind of like a okay, we didn't ask, we didn't have to ask questions because who cared? But like if we cared or whatever, we knew. But they just always, I don't know. There's just a part of me that's like it didn't have to be this announcement this type of way. I just think it's like very silly to me. But then there was a part of me that wondered. Is this something else? And you know I'm always going to do my digging. So I talked to some people in Hollywood. Yeah, I know some people down over there on the West Coast. And what I found on Earth that there has been speculation about the timeliness of when Lena and Cynthia dated, right? And I think I've talked about this already. Like, Cynthia was in pictures at Lena Waite's house. And you could Google this. During the pandemic. And that was during the time when Lena abruptly divorced from her wife. Her and her wife broke up. 
And it was speculations that Le allegations allegedly, allegedly that Lena was cheating on, on her wife. And they were only married for a small stint of time, but they dated for so long. And, and her wife, her ex-wife is beautiful. They broke up, okay? Divorced everything. But during that time, when that was happening, or whispers, I was recognizing that it looked like Cynthia and Lena were quarantined together. So I'm kind of like, was you the quick, fast rebound? At the moment that her and her wife broke up, you kind of like slid right in there. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So I wondered to myself, why would they take long? Because Cynthia did not want that attention happening. So they so she took time. And what's funny is, is that she's come out as bisexual, but she has not revealed that her and Lena are dating. So it's almost like it's a slow but steady process, but we already know what it is. Hollywood. Like, this is giving Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie on a lower level, but the same type of situation where we already knew, and except I will give it to Brad and, and Jennifer, well, no, well, Brad and Angelina, like, they didn't hide it immediately. I mean, they met on the set, and he was still married. It was a little messy, but look how they done broke up now. You know, how you get them is how you lose them, they say. Um, but it's interesting. I'm just like, okay. Mm -hmm. So that just took me for a spin. In wrapping up, because this has been an episode, um, there's been a lot of talk about um, P-Valley. And I just want to say, fuck Lou Duvall. If you don't know who he is, it doesn't matter. He's transphobic. He's homophobic. And clearly he's suppressed in many ways. Um, he's been talking about P-Valley. And quite frankly, P-Valley is on his second season. So if you want to talk about sex scenes and this, that, and the third, no one cares. P Valley is an incredible show. I've been talking about it. I've been talking about Katori Hall, how I love her. I love this production. P Valley has been killing it. These episodes have been marvelous. The stories have been juicy. The 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 ideas, the concepts, it's been they're touching everything this season. Colorism, uh homophobia, sexism, racism. Domestic abuse, body. I mean, it's it's a lot of things being talked about this season. This is very good. And they're doing it, they're doing it in a way that doesn't give too much of that piece, like that PSA type of thing. Like, you know how some TV shows, like they do it in a way that makes you feel like, oh my goodness, you know, we, we you know, you know, like a we're, this is the episode, this is the episode where we talk about uh racism. It's like every episode they're weaving in these things consistently. And they're talking about it, and it's a part of it, and it's so good. It's just a great season. I was worried that the energy around P Valley was going to fade because it took long for them to get to season two. And so I thought, like, oh, well, people still have this excitement. Because the way that P Valley, the first season, dropped and hit during the pandemic, it was a pandemic, like, blockbuster. And then there was, like, a gap year. I think, like, 2020 came out, 2021, we didn't hear anything. And it was just like, it was a long gap. And we didn't know if, when we was going to hear about that show. And then they just kind of came through again. And they this season has been beautiful. So it's been a great show. If you are looking for good shows, watch P-Valley. P-Valley is incredible. I, I It's black. It's queer. It's pro-sex work. It's feminist. It's cameos. There's all these great cameos. It's just a great show. The other show I want to drop on y'all, even though this is not a show of quality, is Baddies. Batty South on Zeus Network. I know, I know. I'll just say this. If you're watching Ratchet TV, if you've been watching this reality show, it has been giving me my feel. I thought I wasn't going to like it, but it's been interesting. I mean, let me just be clear. It's nothing but a bunch of violence, but it's, it's, it's been, a, you know, it's been, it's, I, it, it, listen, there's not a, it's, 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 there's not been a dry period. This Christian rock girl who's been dating Blueface, and this might be over a lot of you all's heads, it's fine. Blueface is a irrelevant rapper that no one really knows about. Well, he is known to a cult following of Gen Zers and a couple of millennials. He had a, a popular hit song that was an urban hit called Thotsiana that came out many years ago. I do like the beat. He's not a good rapper, but but Bust Down Thotsiana is a cute little bop. Um, Cardi B did a remix, and her remix and her verse is way better. He's not really all that. He's just some tatted dude that's like so bro -y. But Christiana Rock, who is his very 
interesting girlfriend on and off girlfriend. She's been making the waves all over social media, especially within the shade room. And I am happy I've been watching this show because I've been able to see her on the show. So it's made me understand her craziness around this man that she's been pursuing, Blueface. And his face isn't blue, he's light skinned. He's light skinned black guy. But she's an interesting person. And this their relationship drama is just like, is what the shade room is devouring. Like they're eating it up like it's like a croissant. A really good fresh cro croissant, let's be clear. But you know, it's interesting. But Batty South has been interesting. Nellie Nunn. So my friend, my bestie, Amanda, her boyfriend Joe shared this video clip about um, ooh, Joe. Yes, Joe. Joe has his name. He has a shout out. But he shared a clip that um that 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 struck to me where he basically was showing Nally. I think he was responding to a clip of Nally Nunn back in her early um Bad Girls Club era where she was super colorist, very anti black. Very problematic. She was. She looked very different. Now people can change over the years, but I thought it was interesting. The very things that she was talking trash about on that clip many years ago, right when she was Nally Nunn from L.A. and from Miss Run This City, all that kind of stuff. That she's become the very girl that she was talking about was ghetto. Like the very character assassination she was making about certain black girls on that show she basically became and created a show with those same girls and has profited and that's the problem with capitalism people just saying interesting but that's you know very interesting observation but you know nonetheless well this is the end of season two this was a great season y'all this is fun many surprises many loops and dangles many you know Shockers and surprises and spontaneous things. And now season three, as we get into the road to episode 100, um, more surprises. What's to come from the book? What's next with this convention? How does my New York trip travels next time on the season three premiere of Earnestly Speaking, which will be on Monday, July 18th. So, looking forward to seeing all of you all. Have a happy Fourth of Jamarcus. You know, mind your business in these streets. Be cute. Be polite. Wear a mask. Get your get your booster on if you if you can. Be smart. Be well. Enjoy your July. And as always, be well and be best. Earnestly speaking, is recorded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and can be found on Apple Podcasts. Google Podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mr. Ernest Owens. Use the hashtag Earnestly Speaking to tell me what you thought about this episode and check out my website at ErnestOwens.com.